8,000 people attended the first meeting in Harlem. Those meetings are crackling with tension. By the time those speakers get onto that stage, there are catcalls, there are shouting, and there is an electric feel. There's 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 people outside some of these meetings, singing the International Army, shouting insults and trading insults with those supporters of the war. It's an electric atmosphere. The way in which Goldman and Berkman faced the war fury of 1917, said a friend, was the most stirring manifestation of sheer physical courage I have ever seen. But to the government, America's most famous anarchists had to be stopped. Free speech is always at risk, and one of her great contributions is really to have pushed it as far as it did go. She used it a bit like a toy to see what she could do with it before it broke. And then it did break in her hands. On the afternoon of June 15th, a federal marshal and his deputies bounded up the stairs of Goldman's East 125th Street address and ransacked the place. The raiders made off with a wagon load of Goldman's papers, including what one detective called a splendidly kept card index of reds, the subscription list of Mother Earth. Goldman and Berkman were charged with conspiracy to violate the Draft Act, a federal offense. At trial, Goldman pointed out the contradictions between fighting for freedom and liberty abroad and suppressing them at home. If America had entered the war to make the world safe for democracy, Goldman insisted, she must first make democracy safe in America. After 39 minutes of deliberation, the jury announced a verdict. Guilty. Goldman and Berkman spent 22 months behind bars, much of it tracking events in Russia. The great October of 1917 had ended three centuries of Romanov rule virtually overnight. It was the culmination of a dream by both anarchists and Marxists, and a time to place partisan rivalries aside. Goldman and Berkman put their trust in the Bolsheviks. There was great hope that the, the Russian experience will lead to this future idealistic kind of society that she was hoping for. From the vantage point of 1919, that seemed quite uh, feasible. At last, the great moment arrived. Russia has started something that could leak into this country, that could take hold of this country and make it another communist socialist country. And the people that we must target must be those who support the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. And they did. Throughout the autumn of 1919, Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer directed roundups of radicals in what would come to be known as the Palmer Raids. Thousands of arrests were made without warrants. Those arrested were held for weeks without bail, without access to counsel, even without notification of their families. Before it was all over, an FBI official declared, I believe that with these raids, the backbone of the radical movement in America is broken. 
the government wanted people like Goldman and Berkman out of the country because they could be catalysts for what was seen as a potentially disruptive, reinvigorated labor movement. And it's completely impossible to understand that separate from this red scare. They went hand in hand. On September 27, 1919, America's most famous anarchists walked out of prison. Berkman soon followed. To Goldman, the America she greeted upon release reminded her of the czarist tyranny she had fled at the age of 16. By December 5th, Goldman and Berkman were prisoners again this time at Ellis Island. They had already been served warrants for their deportation. She knows she's going to be deported. She believes it. Just like she knew that there was going to be hard, bad times as World War I creaked into motion, she also knew that she was going to be deported. There's no question of that. She knew it, and she expects to go. From her cell, Goldman wrote a friend how strange it was for one who'd lived and worked in the United States for more than half her life to be thrown out of the country for mere opinion's sake. Their mad rush in getting us out of the country is the greatest proof to me that I have served the cause of humanity, that I have never wavered or compromised. She went with a, quite a bit of bravado. Uh, it was very, very tough. And she had been living here for over 30 years. She was an American. To be kicked out like that was a tremendous shock. Early in the morning of December 21st, Emma Goldman, Alexander Berkman, and 247 other immigrant detainees were suddenly awakened and told to prepare for departure. Searchlights swept the island as they were hurried down a long corridor. At 4 a.m., the deportees were loaded onto barges that ferried them to the SS Buford. One does not live in a country 34 years and find it easy to go. All the turmoil of body and soul, all the love and hate that come to an intense human being have come to me here. I have helped to sow the seeds and hope to see their fruition even if I will be too far away to participate in the harvest. As the Buford slipped from her berth, a group of newspaper reporters and congressmen cheered. With prohibition coming in and Emma Goldman going out, one of them quipped, "'Twill be a dull country." On January 19, 1920, after crossing Finland in sealed railroad cars, Goldman, Berkman, and the other deportees reached Soviet Russia. It seems like a great period of freedom and liberation and hope that the world will be different. If Russia can change, if Russia can democratize, if Russia can give hope to people, then there's hope for any, any country in the world. And this is at the end of three and a half years of a, of a very devastating world war, a bloodbath of a world war. 